Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. So when somebody shops on Instacart, do they shop at a particular retailer or do they shop for a particular item? Good question. The mechanics of an Instacart order is you make an order at a particular store. So the experience is that you are shopping at Grocer X, not that I'm looking for a grocery item and show me all the places it's at and let me pick on whatever price reviews. And, and I think that's a really important aspect. And we try to preserve as much this kind of the mentality because what we found early on is that people have strong brand affinity. This is my store. This is the store I go to. I trust them. I trust their produce. I trust that they don't put moldy bread out. And I think that based on our understanding of how people actually think about it, we were able to model our shopping experience very similar to how people think. When you look at Instacart and you see your store, the place that has the butcher that you trust on there, then you are more inclined to engage than this kind of anonymous warehouse of meat that where my food comes from. People don't trust it. And so yeah. that's something we learned early on and, and it really, I think, has paid off. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. Though I think, I wonder about in terms of convenience, obviously, you know, I shop at four or five different grocery yeah. stores, depending on what I'm looking yeah. for. Is there any way you can have a cart and have one delivery from several stores, or is that just too complicated? It's not too complicated, and it is possible. I think that our experience is that creating that experience of going to different stores and creating different orders is not dissimilar to real life. And one of the things that was really interesting we found during COVID is that we had a large influx of less tech-savvy, much older users that came onto the platform really quickly. And so we had to do a lot of very rapid user studies to understand our platform and try to make it as clear as possible. And so I think we're always learning and we're always trying to, to innovate and make it easier to understand and make it easier to, to execute. I think that to me, it's about trust and it's about a positive experience less than just like raw, brutal efficiency, right? The, the shopping experience, particularly for groceries, is very is a very trust-driven relationship versus like if you're buying a set of headphones, you right. just look for the lowest price, right? I get that. Hey, so, you know, you are a pretty serious technologist mm -hmm. and a pretty serious manager of technology. Mm -hmm. And I'm just reading about your work and your interests you pay a lot of attention to, to cost. You pay a lot of attention to efficiencies. Mm -hmm. I think I believe that your field, your practice is called infrastructure engineering. So I really wanted to understand what are, what is that? Yeah. How, what's, what's the worldview? How do you go about thinking and how do you go about managing teams or managing the work? Infrastructure engineering, I th you know, it, it, maybe in its... Worst form is just a rebranding of what people would call ops, like a, a, a knock where people go and they carry pagers and they respond to when things are broken. It, it, is, a, it is a kind of a holdover of the kind of da data center days. There's some of the older methodologies for developing software where developers wrote code and operators were in production. But what I found was that over the years since 2000, the, the dawn of Agile and certainly the DevOps movement, I, I think most people realize that the, the correct canonical way for organizing a software company to move fast to engage with its customers is a federated group of focused teams who have a lot of local agency to make decisions. And over and over again, I think that people have both empirically experienced this as the, the, the recipe for success. And so all of these companies are now following that pattern. But what I think they haven't found is that let's say all of a sudden now I have a thousand developers organized in a hundred teams. At some level, this starts to become very unwieldy. Either the, the user experience breaks down or the developer experience breaks down. And so where I really see infrastructure in the modern era is trying to solve the problem of how do you scale these companies without breaking down the agency and velocity of these teams. Because the instinct companies have is to centralize, to create consistency, to create efficiency. Everybody's going to use the same thing and that's what's going to save us money and make us go faster. But you need to resist that instinct. That is true in some cases, but for the most part, your primary focus should be velocity of your product teams. And so infrastructure teams are really focused on how do we create feedback for those teams to make great decisions? 
So we hire specialists in security, we hire specialists in reliability and quality performance. And a lot of, especially the early engagements for infrastructure revolve around data. How do we return data to teams about the security position of the software they're creating or the quality or the reliability? And SRE falls into that model and there's a lot of people who have a lot of different ideas about uh, site reliability engineering. But I think that whether those people are using their expertise and embedded on a team to help them improve, or they're building tools that are being leveraged by many teams, the idea is still the same, that infrastructure is really there to reduce the cost of ownership, of service ownership for all of these teams all at once. And I think there's other disciplines that are also trying to solve this, like in product or design, of how do you unify a user experience across 100 teams? That's definitely a hard problem. But for us... It's how do we reduce the cost of ownership so those engineering teams can continue to move fast and innovate. So how do you coordinate with the other, with your peers, the, the people who are running other pieces of Instacart's technology? Is there the same kind of dynamic between kind of independence and agency and the need for coordination? And, and how do you manage that? What's interesting is that if you took a survey of infrastructure teams across software companies and you asked how many of you have product managers the answer would probably be zero. There's very little product management. And why that's significant is if you ask on the flip side, on their development teams, how many of those have product managers? All of them, of course, they have to have product managers. And I think that this is a really important kind of disconnect because the way that we engage is that they are our customers. And so one of the biggest components of that is not just asking them what they want, it's studying, it's, it's observing, it's collecting data. There's a qualitative and a quantitative aspect to product development. And I think the challenge is that a lot of the people who find themselves in infrastructure are senior engineers who deal with issues of scale. They're not accustomed to, a, to providing service, right? Or to doing product development. And that's an area that at Instacart, we're really trying to develop this concept around how does an infrastructure team treat everyone else as customers and how do we create a product factory internally that engages those customers in a way that is very similar to the way that those teams are engaging, let's say, our shoppers or our our users, our customers. And I think that for me, this is somewhat of a passion. I think that uh, there's a larger burden on us to be transparent and be organized internally. A, A product team that is autonomous and has high agency, there's not a lot of context they have to share with the rest of the org in order to get their job done. And so if you looked across, let's say, all the directors that work in my org, the the directors that work in my org have a much higher burden for transparency and organization because they are coordinating across all of these teams. And I think sometimes that is also hard to comprehend that we are different because our customers are internal. No, I don't want to get too far down into the weeds here for our our listeners, but I am curious, you know, you've talked about agile, you've talked about DevOps. These are two of the most important trends in software development. And I'm frankly going to admit that I don't really understand the distinction or the complementary aspects Mm -hmm. of them. So (laughs) there seems to be a lot of overlap. So what do you see as the key elements and differentiators in each of these and and which approach do you use most? Sure. To me, in my mind, the distinction agile is really about a, 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 a smarter kind of faster way to develop products and DevOps was a smarter, faster way to own the products that you create. And I think that over time, it's really fascinating to me because you will see lots of different versions of the uh, buzzword DevOps. You'll see DevSecOps, DevFinOps. You'll see DevSecFinQualOps. Like you see these crazy acronyms. And and the reason that they keep expanding is that what I try to say is that service ownership is really the natural evolution of DevOps. This idea that you're going to create something and then you're going to own and operate it. That's what cloud computing is all about. And that's what users expect. We no longer sell software on a CD anymore. It's, It's a service that you subscribe to. And so service ownership is a critical component of, of the evolution of DevOps and all of the aspects of ownership, that's financial, that's security, that's quality, that's operations, that's development, are all integrated in that kind of concept of service ownership. I think Agile uh, itself is 
likely one of those things that becomes a dirty word over time. It gets overloaded. And even some the ceremonies and processes associated with it almost form a kind of uh, negative outlook. If you go to a development team and you're like, hey, I'm here to implement Agile, I don't think that they're going to be super excited with you these days, just because they associate it with a lot of ceremony and process. And I think that there's good parts to Agile and there's probably parts that need to get back to first principles instead of tools, if, 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 if that makes sense. But I think that it is the de facto way to build software now. I, nobody, I grew up writing what they used to call SRS, a software requirement specification, and it was a numbered document. And so it's requirement 10.1.2.3.1. And we used to have to try to, you, you had to be smart in creating your numbering schemes. And so this form of software development where I create a numbered spec, somebody writes the code and then somebody else tests against the spec is just really gone. It, I, I rarely see anyone doing that. It's interesting to look at Agile and it's been adopted in lots of other industries and lots of other processes out of software. I'm a journalist. I worked for many years at daily newspapers. I got to tell you, daily newspapers were agile before agile. Was agile. <laughs> yeah. That's You'd get up, you'd arrive at work at six o'clock in the morning, you'd have a scrum. Right. right. Everybody race off and get it done. And then there was the process of the writing, the editing, the, the typesetting and the running of the press all on a mad scramble. Right. And, uh, and that was the way we did it. So it's fun to see it coming back in all these other industries. Yeah, I always felt Agile yeah. was an excuse to just like improvise. And that wasn't uh-huh. the point, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, yeah. the point was yeah. get as close to your customer as possible and iterate as fast as you can. And do, don't create any process that detracts from that. But you have to be organized in order to create high quality software. These are very complex machines right. we're making. And so going YOLO and just freewheeling it and calling it agile, <laughs> the outcome is usually always the same. It's messy, it's messy right? Yeah. I don't need to do experiments yeah. to find out what humans believe about incomplete or bad software. I already know the outcome. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. We always end our podcast by asking people to cast into the future, to, to put on their visionary cap you know, in the air in your area of expertise. So cast ahead five years and give us a sense of like where we are now and where we'll be then and what difference that will make for businesses or even for consumers. I think that as I work through these companies and and, and I see some of the same challenges associated with scaling, it strikes me that the need for us to solve some of these key infrastructure components and one of the key areas is the developer experience, right? What is the developer experience like? On one hand, it can be so stifling and so centralized and so painful because I have to learn all of these ways that the company forces me to do work that I just, it stifles creativity. And on the other hand, I have so much agency and I'm creating so much variety across the company that the complexity starts to cave in on itself. And so we haven't found a balance yet. And I think that, A lot of what I'm seeing, and I mentioned before, is that the velocity of just the world, the amount of information, the competition, is just keeps going faster and faster and faster. Slack was the fastest to a billion ever, but I guarantee that record will be broken almost immediately, right, by the next people who come who will be even faster. And so I think that pressure is going to put a lot more demand on finding the balance. How does an infrastructure team create a developer experience that does abstract away some technical debt that allows you know, teams to be creative and innovate, but is balanced in that it doesn't create so much complexity that the company implodes on itself and has to go through these surges. It's a very classic term you'll hear in Silicon Valley. We need to do a quality surge or reliability surge. Like Those are strong signals that you likely are moving too late. And so uh, as you look forward, I think that it wasn't that long ago we were standing uh, in a data center and we were pulling cable and we were ripping out drives and replacing them. And we all said, the cloud's cool, but no one's going to use that for real work. And I think the same thing is somewhat true now in infrastructure where you look at managed services and people will look at a managed database or a managed kind of streaming process. And they'll say, that's great and all for people who don't know what they're doing, but hey, man, we know what we're doing. We're going to run our own Kafka, which is a streaming, open source streaming service, or we're going to run our own MySQL databases. And I think the question will continually escalate to what's the value in you doing it yourself? 
And I think the answer to that is increasingly going to be more and more kind of subscriptions or cloud managed services for things that are not differentiating to your business. And I don't think that concept is new. Buy versus build has been around forever, forever. I can remember old IBM consultants giving the, the sage advice of never build something that doesn't differentiate your business. But I, I do believe like in, in today's time, the average software company has something like 300 SaaS subscriptions. So this is accelerating and having the glue and the engineering teams internally to transform all of these tools into a cohesive experience is going to be the next big kind of breakthrough for tech. Yeah, yeah. And that's done at the infrastructure level? I believe so. Or is there kind of, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That's I think the developer experience ultimately needs to fall on the infrastructure team. And mm -hmm. that's a combination of some what you would call, let's say, low level, like networking and abstracting away the complexity of running a global network or of some of the, at Slack, we use this term computering. <laughs> how to computer uh, can be complicated, especially at large scale. Yeah. And so how do you abstract that away? And so you do have these kind of very detailed, low level kind of abstractions, but you have to go all the way up to the very, to the workflows and how work, how, what's the value stream for each thing? How does a bug get fixed? How does a new feature get solved? And how are you instrumenting those things and making sure that the, the you know, very lean product delivery concept and infrastructure of like, we're constantly evaluating our value streams. You know, Dustin, it's been great speaking to you today. I have this vision of you. I feel like you're the guy down in the boiler room <laughs> of the great and fast ship Instacart. But I feel like we've had a little lesson here or a big lesson mm -hmm. here in, in infrastructure management, infrastructure engineering, teams, this great ongoing kind of balance that organizations have to have between independence and, and central control or standardization. And I think it's just, I, I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate the kind of work that has to be done uh, down in the boiler room to really make these amazing technologies that they, they interact right. with work and respond and always be there for them and things like that. So I think it's been really uh, instructional. It's, it's been good talking to you today. Thank you so much for having me. While I have the pulpit, I will just do a quick pitch to the CEOs out there that effective investment in infrastructure is really your best defense against your next competitor, which is really just two women in a dorm room starting a company and they're coming for you. And so infrastructure is the easiest way to keep yourself ahead of the game. Well said, Dustin. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Snowflake. Register for Snowflake's first full day virtual conference, Data Cloud Summit 2020. Engage with thousands of your peers in any of the eight business and technology summit tracks presented by technology experts and industry data leaders. Be there for the announcement of Snowflake's latest innovations and get access to never before seen demos and customer case studies. Register for free at snowflake.com summit.